hello good evening to those in the uk and europe and welcome to others joining from elsewhere matthews who was long listed for the 2021 lumen prize for her work dreams again and here she is hi hi can you hear me yes can you hear me yes how are you today? perfect very well and yourself good thank you so um, let's start with introductions, as we always do. My name is Madeline Pierpont. I manage partnership development for the Art Project, which is the parent company for art and um, And we are so excited that we just recently announced our 2021 long list, which Madeline was part of for her work, Dreams. So welcome, Emma Kate. Hi, nice to be here. Um, so to start, I want to talk a little bit about your practice in general. You, and I'm going to quote you, here, you describe your practice on the reciprocities between music as constructed sound and constructed space. So I wondered if you could elaborate on about you in the relationship between constructed sound down. Yeah, definitely. So um, as both an architect and a composer, I'm interested in finding finding ways in which the practices of both making space and making music can be more precisely calibrated with each other. Because I, I feel like there's a lot of um, overlap between the both both of the disciplines, both in a practical sense, but also conceptually. So in, in the sense that architecture kind of organises space and music organises sound. Um, and one one of the ways that I do that in my work is I, I quite often work with spaces that have really distinctive acoustic conditions, but also um, within a sort of musical context, I, I work with um, representations of certain spatial phenomena using music as, as a sort of articulate medium. Mm -hmm. And obviously technology plays an absolutely huge part in this because I, I need to simulate certain acoustic conditions or also you know I design and make some of my own instruments to make specific sounds as well in order to achieve those representations of spaces or spatial conditions. So on your website I love this this quote that you, you uh, relay to the listener or the, or the visitor and you say come for unbeatable content. So um, going off of that quote what is it what is your process in transition? And then what, what excites you about always having unpredictable um, experiences around it? Yeah, the, so the, the sort of unpredictability side of it, um, I think that's more relevant to when I'm listening to, to music or when I'm uh, looking at certain architectural or spatial references and I, I don't know sort of what, what's going what's gonna to come up, but also in, in, in my process, there's a between the research and the practice there's there's a speculative aspect to the work and that's the the exciting kind of unknown aspect um and then there's there's a more focused series of of studies or or experiments that happen within the compositional process so it's it's more a case of kind of balancing the the unpredictable with the the focused and the the more rigorous um and, and reflexive ways of working and again sort of the the technology side of it is really important in this sense because sometimes the speculative work can be can be very broad and very sort of wide reaching but some of the tools that i make some of the digital tools that i make for analyzing spaces or analyzing sound that can really help me to focus my creative ambitions but but in a way that's that's also conceptually rigorous if that makes sense mm -hmm. so tying that into your work again, congratulations for being a part of the one long list for those listening in or watching can you describe dreams again what yeah, Dreams Again is um, it's an audiovisual piece of work, and in this piece, I was trying to create a, a sort of tension between ideas of synthesized space or synthesized materiality and um, and analog versions of, of the same thing. So there's a visual aspect to it and a, and a sonic aspect to it, and they they also interact with each other. Um, so in the video, there's a there's a simulation of a, a sort of falling cloth 
but this cloth is also programmed to respond to certain sonic aspects of, of the music and within the music as well um there are a series of that is quite quite a rich kind of layered piece one layer includes um sounds that i got from a a series of bespoke polyphonic tuning forks that i designed and made specifically for this piece so that's that's the kind of analog side of it um and i recorded also recorded some some field recordings using binaural microphones so this this kind of this captures the spatiality of of other sound, less focused sounds but then there's there's also another component which is fully synthesized and that was um so the, the individual sounds are synthesized but also the way that they sort of behave in an in a virtual space so i'm i'm using things like convolution reverb and um impulse responses from specific places that i've visited to simulate another sense of space so there's a there's a kind of virtual sense of space and a and an actual sense of space coming together in the same piece and it's it all sort of mushes together for want of a better word <laughs> so i do not know what a polyphonic tuning fork is but i'm curious can you can you uh explain what that what that is and how it i know you you just mentioned that but describe what it is how it is it's i'd like to think i hope it's something that i've invented because i've never seen them before um i i started making originally just started making tuning forks um you know with the, the sort of two prongs and you bash it and it sort of makes a sound makes a, a single tone but then um the the first one that i made was was made using uh, laser sintered steel and it's it's sort of it uh it gets made in layers and it had all these kind of weird unpredictable qualities to it so if you hit it in different directions it made different tones and i thought oh this is interesting i've never heard a tuning fork that's so unreliable before <laughs> so i started making um unreliable tuning forks as a as a way of giving me some kind of sonic stimulus for future compositions but as time's gone on those tuning forks have become more and more precise so now i'm i'm making um pieces that have they sort of have two sets of prongs and they they play certain intervals so certain sort of harmonic relationships that that feature in quite a lot of my music so when you're when you're working on how do you decide how to layer the sound and where do you normally draw inspiration for what sounds you have in your compositions It's really varied. So, um I'm I'm really lucky at the moment to be able to be working with the London Symphony Orchestra on their Panofnik composer scheme and that's that's been a huge source of inspiration because we get the opportunity to work with live musicians even throughout some of the lockdown period as well. We we're really lucky that we were able to work um with live musicians and acoustic instruments, but then I also have quite a a library of my own synthesized sounds that either come from instruments that I've made physically or or digitally things that I've programmed or or coded um and one of the things that I'm really interested in at the moment is trying to sort of evoke a sense of space or a sense of architecture um more precisely so um and and really the one of the ways that I start the compositional process is I I always start with a drawing. I don't know if that's because I trained as an architect or or quite why I do that, but I always start with a drawing that sort of it literally forms the shape of the piece of music. So the the audio the, the sort of order audio and the visual are very much interlinked not just in in the piece that that you see with dreams again, but throughout the whole process I'm I'm constantly moving between drawing making things in 3D and sounding things and and checking again sort of how things are how those things are either represented musically or how they literally respond to an acoustic condition for instance i mean yeah, for my there are many compelling parts of it again but one of the most elements is that sound is related visually i just think is so fascinating you t- we do that your work unique in that in that respect 
Yeah, I think this this sort of um, this the relationship between what you're seeing and what you're hearing is really important. So quite often, especially in in architectural practice, sound is treated as a very separate element or sound and hearing is treated as a very separate element to just generally the experience of space or the experience of the visual world. But I'd, I'd like to think that the way that I work and, and the pieces that people are able to experience it hopefully sort of brings all of the senses together and says this is not just about sound it's not just about vision but it's about this this combination of of all of the senses and understanding how creatively where the opportunities lie in in those kind of multi-sensory heavily spatialized experiences speaking about senses i i feel like the sensory world, the way senses have changed um, in the new current context that we're living in. Has COVID impacted your practice? Definitely. Um, so just in a sort of a really practical way, um, I've, I've not been able to do things like hire rehearsal studios and, and try things in, in, in real spaces. So I've had to do things like build 3D models, 3D digital models and simulate the acoustics within the computer and sort of use that as a, a benchmark um, for for the eventual sort of getting into the real space, which is starting to happen now, which is great. But also just like really little things like becoming really hyper aware of my neighbours and the sounds that they make. So I live in a concrete framed building and everything resonates. You can You can hear every single sound that that touches the concrete surface. So it, even things like my, my upstairs neighbors chopping vegetables and it's sort of, wow. it's maybe, yeah, it's, it's quite sort of on, on the one hand, it's really irritating, but on the other hand, I, it's made me question the relationship between what's become my workspace in, in this room that you see now. Um, and, and the work that I'm making and wondering sort of how the, how the two things might influence each other um, so when I'm making noise or when they're making noise and, and just sort of questioning what, I, I suppose, going forward, what I want my workspace to be. You know, could it be more of an extension of, of the work that I'm doing? And could that relationship between my immediate environment and the things that I'm producing, could it be more active? Um, and I don't think I would have questioned that had I not been working from home so intensively over the, the lockdown period. So you just recently released uh, Remote Overlap. I think it was last week that you released it. Last week. Um, yeah, or the week, maybe the end of the week before, I think. But yeah, very, very recently. Well, congratulations. Um, for those who are listening as well, can you describe that? Because I think it does have some of the themes we were just talking about. Um, a little bit about that work and how it works. Um, our perceptions of it. yeah so that that piece was um it was commissioned during lockdown um and it released on nmc records quite recently and it was really um it's exploring ideas of this this sort of desire for closeness so the d desire for physical contact that that we were all experiencing throughout the, the first lockdown when we were told that we couldn't go and see loved ones or hug our friends and uh, maybe quite a sort of obvious thing to pick, but because quite a lot of my work prior to that um, involved the spatialization of musicians around the space or the spatialization of um, sound sources. So this this was quite an interesting opportunity to really question what that could, how that could work in a recorded piece rather than a performed piece. So, um, you know, necessarily when, when it was being recorded, the musicians were, were quite far apart from each other for social distancing reasons, not for creative reasons. But actually, it, it really helped to emphasize some of the concepts in the work. So, for instance, in the recording, you can really hear the, clearly hear the, the clarinets very clearly localized and far away from the piano. And that's that's reinforced in some with some of the musical aspect so for instance the, the clarinets playing these sort of microtonal multiphonics um a, around a, this a similar tone to what the piano is playing at times but it never so you get this feeling that they're trying to sort of reach each other they're trying to get to the same tone but they never quite get there and and i think again um 
if you if that would have been just a performed piece that that people the audience would have been able to visit the space perhaps some of those relationships wouldn't have been so intensely expressed i think the recording is act- has actually really really successfully sort of reinforced some of those ideas that that i was trying to get through in the music um so yeah that that was the main the main sort of driver for that piece for the, for the concept of that piece was this trying to trying to make a, a musical version of this desire for, for physical closeness that's fascinating so the actual logistics of isolation impacted the the musical output of the work. that's really really interesting so what are you going to be working on or uh, releasing soon so the the thing that I'm working on at the moment is um, a piece for the, the London Symphony Orchestra, which will be performed next March. Um, and this is part of the Panophonic Composer Scheme. And again, this is a piece that will be, it, it's learning from past pieces, but understanding um, how to work with concepts that might be familiar in architectural practice or spatial practice, and, and how those ideas can be expressed and articulated through the, the medium of the orchestra, which is already a very sort of spatial um, monster. <laughs> you can't sort of get away from the fact that it's, it's, it's already sort of very large and a very organized set of sounds. Um, but I'm trying to, trying to orchestrate spatial concepts and um, that, that's something that I'm, I'm working on at the moment. And I'm also working on um, another EP, which will have audio, interactive audiovisual elements to it, which I, I'm not going to give too much away on that for now, but uh, <laughs> it's coming. Very exciting. So you're also a researcher at University College London. How does your, what are you currently working on? And how does that impact your so happily, my research um, at the Bartlett, which is where, where I also teach, um, it's it focuses, it's very much interlinked with my practice. So I think I, I, I mentioned earlier, there's a, there are these two parallel streams to my work. One is highly speculative and one is very focused and, and more kind of practically rigorous. And the, the research is really useful because it gives me license to, to play and to to make wild speculations about things or or do sort of completely wacky experiments and and then i have time to to really analyze the outputs of those experiments and speculations and and think okay you know cherry pick the best bits and and use that for stimulus in in my practice based work so it's it's really nicely um interlinked and it's it's the research that my phd which which isn't quite finished yet, um, but it, it's, I've got supervisors within the architecture school, but also at the, the Royal Academy of Music. So there's a really nice dialogue going on between the two areas. I just think the relationship between architecture and sound is fascinating. So I'm really looking forward to seeing the, the composition for the um, Well, I will not take much more of your time, but one last question. And maybe this is, there haven't been any challenges, but what have you experienced as the great talent artist in this, at the intersection of architecture, sound, and digital art? Yeah, the, the, this is a really interesting question because it's, it's one of those things that um, it's quite, sometimes quite difficult to, to look back on your work and, and think about the, the things that may not have gone to plan or, or some of the challenges, as you say, <clears throat> and I think one of the main challenges, especially working between architecture and music, is communication. Because in architecture, there's a very uh, standard way of communicating how spaces might be made, and the same in music. Um, so it's I've, I've always found it quite difficult to get the balance between um, systems of notation that that I might have to invent to to make relationships clear. But then also balancing that with traditional notation, which is which is perhaps more reliable in terms of how it gets interpreted. So there's a, it's not. I wouldn't say it's a, a sort of a, a bad thing. It's it's just an ongoing problem that's quite a fun problem to have because you have to be quite creative with 
with how those areas of overlap are, are communi ugh, communicated, I can't <laughs> even losing my own words, communicated um, across disciplines and, and especially between these two very sort of specialist groups. Well, I think it'll be interesting to see how people perceive the space and also sound, you know, as we all start to get back, hopefully soon, out of sort of isolation mode. It'll be really interesting. Definitely. Well, thank you so much, McKay, for joining us. And thank you to everyone who tuned in. And have a lovely rest of your day. Great to be here. Thanks a lot. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.